Hello and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer. Over the past four years, we've featured a wide variety of different types of professionals on this show. From CEOs to CMOs, heads of operation to people leaders, we've really been fortunate to have a diverse set uh, represented. Today, we've got a new role for you. Vernon Griffin is the Vice President of Global Procurement for Northern Trust Corporation, and he's here with us to talk about what it takes to create a great place to work, a high-performing culture, and the future of his role. Let's get started. Vernon, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited you came into BOS to be in person and have been looking forward to this conversation for a while. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to having this discussion. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. So let's start with the question we ask every guest. Tell us your professional story. How did you get to where you're at today? Well, ironically, I never even knew that there was a profession called procurement. <laughs> you know, I mean, who knows that if you could actually have a career buying stuff mm -hmm. for people because we all buy things like, you know, we all buy stuff where we all assume that we are a procurement expert, mm -hmm. but who, who really gets the opportunity to get paid to do so? I have been practicing procurement for 24 years. I started off as a, propos a promotional items buyer for Anderson Consulting, which became Accenture. Mm. I was there for 13 years, and then I left and I went to IBM for five. In the past five years, I've been in Northern Trust, where I am a VP. I am the global facilities category lead within procurement. So basically, my job is to make sure that my customers buy the right goods and services at the right price under the right T's and C's using the right procurement method. And if I did that, I did my job. Excellent. Well, we're going to talk about procurement a little bit in this conversation because you're the first procurement person we've had on the show. So right. fascinating. It is hilarious that, you know, growing up, what do you, what do you want to do when you grow, grow up? I want to buy things. Right. <laughs> you know, like, I love that. And you also said pr practicing procurement. Yes. Talk yes. about that for a minute. Well, because if you look at being in the medical profession or practicing law, they tell you up front that they're practicing it mm -hmm. so that they haven't mastered it. Mm -hmm. So a doctor may lose a patient, unfortunately. A lawyer, he, may, he or she or they may lose a case. I mm -hmm. think that procurement professionals, the good ones, understand that we are a evolving science. Mm -hmm. So you may have a great contract now, but then COVID happens mm -hmm. and then it's not so good a contract. So to give yourself that flexibility of that movement, mm -hmm. that um, it is an evolving science, you're always learning and it's not so black and white. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, excited to unpack that a little bit further, but first let's talk about really the reason we created this podcast was to talk to people in different industries at different companies and different roles about what it, is to create a great place to work. And you have worked for some incredible organizations, Accenture, IBM, Northern Trust. Those are well-known businesses. What, in your opinion, does it take to create a great place to work? Or what does a great place to work look like from your perspective? It's three things. Okay. First thing, it is culture. Mm. So it doesn't matter if you're um, white, black, purple, polka dot, short, tall, fat, skinny. If you're brilliant at what you do, and if you add value, there is a place for you in those organizations. Mm -hmm. So it was great to work at presently and at previous um, firms in which it was a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So you were able, to, you were just on your output. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. um, second thing, it is opportunity. So obviously you wanna be able to work at a place in which you are able to grow unprofessionally and also financially. So they give you opportunities to be able to continue to move up mm -hmm. in your you know, particular category. And the last thing to me is representation. Um, being a person of color, uh, it's really important to be able to work in a space in which you automatically can associate or recognize mm -hmm. someone who is in leadership or who works there. Um, there are others who take that for granted, but it's really difficult if you don't see that representation. Um, I bring it back to, I think it's great that now, that now kids, African-American kids can grow up thinking that they could be president. Mm. When I was growing up, 
that was the equivalent of a person landing on the sun. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't a possibility. So representation is key. And it's ironic as I have been able to advance in my career. Now I'm the person that others are joining the firms with and they see me as that, that person. So I think that, that that's neat. And um, I welcome the responsibility of being that caretaker. That's, that's incredible. I, I, I love those three components. I think opportunity for advancement and representation are fairly leadership directed components of an organization. Leaders have to make that a priority. They have to open the door for growth within their organization. But the other one you talked about was culture. And we do talk about leadership driven culture, but we also know that within organizations, there exists culture that is directly related to the employees themselves. It's not necessarily what the CEO or the president yeah, says. Agree. It's agree. everybody. So talk about that. I, you know, what who, whose responsibility is culture within an organization? So, to me, everyone has the responsibility to create the work environment in which he, she, or they wish to work in. Hmm. So I have only worked at organizations in which, while I was there, our goal was to be the best procurement organization in the world. Hmm. That was our like goal each day. Um, it, and if it's not that, then why work? Why are you working? Mm -hmm. You know, so to me, like that is key. So that's one thing, that's our goal. Then the work environment, we 100% dictate that. Mm -hmm. So if it's a new hire, are you going to go over there and introduce yourself or are you gonna wait until their manager comes or whatever? Mm -hmm. Those little small things, like you create your workspace. We have more control over our destiny mm -hmm. than we we realize. One of my favorite poems, it is Invictus, and it ends with that I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. Mm -hmm. Nothing great can be accomplished without enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So great companies have great culture that are energetic. Mm -hmm. It is exciting. Um, it's, it's, it's energy. You need that energy to do great things. Um, it, if work is a slog, it's just not a good work environment. It's not a good culture. People can do or have difficult jobs, but they stay because of the people that they work with. Mm -hmm. um, so um, another aspect is trust. You have to have an environment of trust and allow yourself to be able to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, is that you only learn through bad situations. You only learn if, if everything is rosy and you never had an issue and you work your way up and now you are the CEO and then you have a situation that you never experienced before. You may be paralyzed. You're like, hey, I never had to deal with this. Whereas mm -hmm. if you would have had that in your first two years of working, oh, well, that's fine. I know what to do with that. Sure. You yeah. know, I just pivot and I do that. So you only grow through bad mm -hmm. situations, well, at least challenging situations. Mm -hmm. So I welcome them now. You know, some people are like, oh, I got this email and it's this issue. I try to tell my team, well, that's great, you know, because it's an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. So you have to embrace that. And if you have a culture in which you allow individuals, you give them the room to, to grow and the access to resources or people on which they can learn from, that's how you develop, I think, a winning culture. Mm, I love that. This wasn't on our question set, but as you were talking about some of these things, enthusiasm and yes. energy, yes. trust, yes. and Very relationships important. development, learning opportunities, we've found that those things are accelerated when you're together with people. Yes. And one of the things we saw as a down, uh, something that suffered during the pandemic and the isolation of COVID was some of those exact things. What is your thought on in-person versus remote and, and ways of working? Both are required mm -hmm. in this age to be successful. Mm. So we will never go back to a, a work environment in which it is 100% in, in, in person. Mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side, um, I don't think that 100% virtual is will be the modus operandi going forward. Mm -hmm. So it must be a mix. Um, and you can develop that closeness through both means, mm -hmm. but I think it is accelerated when you are in person. Mm -hmm. You're able to actually physically walk over to that colleague mm -hmm. and and ask them a question. 
Whereas um, via Zoom or Teams, once you log off, you may ping them, but it's not that immediate engagement. Mm -hmm. um, time, spending time is, a, is one of the key fundamental um, elements of building a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that building that time in person mm -hmm. instead of over, again, a large conference call, um, it, it just accelerates that. Be, because um, one of the things I say, I never work with strangers, mm. right? You know, so who are you? Like, what do you do? And that engagement, it just helps. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are able to put a name, a face, a voice to that email, um, it, it breaks so many barriers. Um, we also tend to, to give more grace to people that we have physically met. Mm. Um, as as compared to just a voice, um, not that's not saying you know because if you are just a good person or a nice person, you will extend that you know like regardless. But um, there is an in person dynamic that helps accelerate the connective tissue mm -hmm. that is required, especially within procurement, because one of our jobs is to sell our deals, right? So we have to sell our clients that this is a good contract for us to sign. You know, we have a great price or the teams or um, the terms are great, but a risk has been mitigated. Mm -hmm. We have to sell our suppliers, hey, we're, we're gonna be a great customer. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, just by working with us, even though you're giving us these goods or services for this price, it's, it's, it is a value add for mm -hmm. us to have that type of relationship. It's easier to build that trust by physically interacting with mm -hmm. each other. So, And let's talk about procurement and the role of a procurement person because simply put, you're negotiating contracts, you're buying things, you're putting together buying agreements, but you're selling both ways really because right. if you get too good of a price, the person that is selling you that product or service is going to feel like it's one-sided and they're not. there's not the value there. But you also need to get a great price to have some of the people on your end right. say, well done, Vernon. You know, So how do you find that balance between kind of selling both ways a little bit? So that's a great question. And price is just one element. Sure. Uh, so I would say that um, most people only see a procurement on the just the um, tactical level. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to buy this good or this service from you. And they only see the value in that. Whereas... If you look at purchasing as being a means of helping you um, win more business, mm -hmm. then you start thinking in a more in a more a strategic level. Um, I have a great example. So if me and you, if if we were neighbors mm -hmm. and we brought the same house, they're right beside each other, and we and we work with the same with the same cleaning service. Mm -hmm. But if I'm able to get that cleaning service to clean my house just one percent better than your house. Six months, it may not be a difference, but in a year, they're gonna say, what is that dingy house doing by that great looking mm -hmm. house? And all of that is just because on how I was able to manage the same supplier. Mm. So um, that's an element that procurement professionals look into. So it's not just pricing. There are other value adds that you can benefit from if you know how to ask them. Mm -hmm. And then like the final piece, is once procurement becomes transformational, right? Mm. So once it becomes and you realize that it is a driving force on, on being equitable, um, on, on sustainability and also inclusion, um, all of those aspects can only be driven through procurement practices. Mm. Um, every great thing, it, has been driven through procurement practices, building the um, pyramid, believe it or not. <laughs> really? <laughs> that was a procurement project. <laughs> oh, I didn't think they, that. They, they had to get labor or materials um, to, to, to build that. Um, Oppenheimer, hmm. um, the atomic bomb, again, you had to buy goods, resources, and materials. Um, every important thing has an aspect of procurement hmm. on it. Um, and then once we realize it again, that is when a firm or, or a company is able to jump from just viewing it as like a transaction mm -hmm. uh, compared to how it can actually transform the communities on which they work and live. 
as we are preparing for this interview, we've worked with with we, you and your team in the in the past, and certain members on our team. When I when I mentioned that you were going to come in to talk to us, they're like, oh, "Vernon's amazing. He's such a nice guy." I heard that over and over. He's such a nice guy. Such a nice guy. And you've talked before about you know relationships and then their importance from a procurement perspective. How important is the relationship to find people that you like that are that you think are have the right that matching values? Because okay. I get it from a financial perspective okay. or from a service perspective, right. and maybe even from a confidence of capability from a you know financial you know financial security or the right. terms. But does the value alignment? come into play at all in your decision making process? It can. Okay. But it really is a necessary mm. ultimately for me to be able to do my job mm. because it is my responsibility to make sure I get the best value for my customer mm -hmm. for that particular purchase of product. Um, for my customer, however, um, there is a value for working with vendors that understands our internal culture, mm. our decision-making process, how we need to sell whatever we're buying to our internal partners. Mm. At Northern Trust, we call our colleagues partners. Okay, so, okay. To being able to share that. So if that's adversarial, mm -hmm. if people are running against each other, the boat isn't going anywhere. Mm. So to be able to make substantial change and to reap the um, benefits um, for that particular transaction. It just helps that there is alignment on what the end product or the end goal is. Mm -hmm. um, again, like from my standpoint, I want to make sure that my workplace services customers, mm -hmm. that they are receiving um, the best possible supplier um, every day to help assist them do their work for Northern Trust. And if I accomplish that, then that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, also, too, like the whole world is divided up, in my opinion, into two different groups. It's one group is when they call or email you, you're happy to see their name. <laughs> and the other group is when you see that call or email, you you know, you feel dread. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, I don't know if I want to answer it or not. It is so much more productive to be in that first group mm -hmm. than that latter group. It, and to me, like, that's the... If you have the bottom line, that's the key to a success, to be in that first group that people enjoy working with. Mm. Um, if you can accomplish that, then you can get things done. If you can't accomplish that, you're going to have a difficult time. Not a requirement, but if you want progress at pace, yes. it's Just important. a sustainable progress. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've been in procurement for a long time. How has that role changed over the your career? Fundamentally... It hasn't okay. because to be a great procurement professional, you have to embrace change. Mm -hmm. So the tools may be different. Mm -hmm. um, the way we the way we go about negotiations, it may have changed. When I first started, it was always face-to-face -face negotiations. Mm -hmm. So we would, you know, and you had all of these tricks of, okay, let's, let's go into a conference room that doesn't have any windows or... Let's have food there or not have food or water there. Mm -hmm. Let's have the room be cold or have the room be warm. You had all of these tricks to try to control the environment. But now, what, 95%, 99% of my contract negotiations, they're all virtual. Mm -hmm. But that allows for different opportunities. So during, during those calls, I'm able to instant message mm -hmm. my team members. Hey, can you research this for me? Or... Can you fact check that? You're going through the same processes, but it's different tools. And to be successful, you have to try to find ways to leverage those new tools mm. to give you the information which you need to make fact-based decisions. So to me, procurement has adapted to newer technology because we get information faster, which allows us to help evaluate that information quicker and to be able to make decisions that are grounded in our due diligence. Hmm. Do people go to school for procurement? Is it a major? Yes, they do. However, um, I am a proud speech communications major mm -hmm. from the University of Illinois. I love that. So um, 
there are a supply chain okay. yeah. management degrees. Um, I have had colleagues who are engineers mm. who switched over. Um, and I think that for this particular space, because we all buy things, mm. um, that there is an innate there's innate understanding of what procurement is. Mm -hmm. So the skills in which you may pick up through other majors, through other arts, through other um, science and vocations, all of those are transferable. Hmm. Um, because again, we all practice procurement. Mm -hmm. So bring your gifts and learn um, from, from, from others to help you fill in the gaps on information in which you don't bring to the M table. Mm -hmm. um, I love saying, hey, if you ask me something, hey, I don't know what I don't know. If I don't have the answer for you, we will find out the answer on together. Customers are extremely intuitive and they could tell if you're trying to BS them or not. So it doesn't help to try to present yourself as having you know, you only have this one way. You have to be flexible. You have to embrace change. Mm -hmm. Positive careers are based on being adaptable to different customers' needs at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were playing classical music, it's the same music written in for 400 years ago. You're going to start off this opera with B flat, and it goes to a C, C sharp. Regardless of who comes sees you, they're going to play that same music. I think to be successful within procurement, you must be more like a jazz quartet. Mm. And depending on the um, crowd, you may start this one set with an E sharp, the next set a G flat. You have to listen to what the customers need. You have to see what the environment is. There may be different industries, different circumstances. I've been blessed. I've sourced 33 different categories in my career. Everything except for really hardware, or a temporary professional services. But everything else from microphones to electricity to furniture, obviously, um, HR services, I've been able to source different categories. And the fundamentals of that are the same, but the but you have to be aware of what the of what the nuances are for each customer, mm -hmm. even in the same industry. Mm -hmm. Because working for a very large company in one industry they have different procurement needs than say a startup mm -hmm. or like a mid-sized firm. Uh, one size does not fit all. Mm. Um, the same way a doctor does not treat the same patient the same. He, she, or they, they triage, they do the blood work, and then based on those tests, then they have a course of action. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing with the procurement. It's interesting because I'm, I, I, I'd like to understand your perspective on the future of procurement. Okay. And and when we started this podcast, pandemic hit. And I was like, wow, well, this is an interesting time to be talking, you know, and having a podcast because right. it's everything's changing so quickly. Yes. And now we're kind of beyond the the pandemic, thankfully. Right. And we're starting to talk about AI a lot and right. some of this really disruptive technology that people are saying oh. is a revolution not just for technology but for society. Right. And that we're at the precipice of like we're about to invent the wheel again or the internet again, right. you know? Um, but what what I'm hearing you say is throughout your career, change has been a, con a constant. Yes, totally. And so so we will be talking about change for a very long time, I think. If we keep the podcast running, we'll always be talking about change. But what I'm interested in is when you think about the future and maybe AI and people thinking about how it's going to change the way that they work, what I'm hearing you say is that there is a nuance or almost an art to procurement that you are reading the situation, you're reading the room, you're reading the customer, and it's not so contractual maybe, but it's more, it's a better, it's an understanding of a situation so that you can negotiate or come up with the right outcome. So that's part of it. Okay. So I do believe that through technology, that 100% of the tactical purchasing will fall into that space. Okay because that is what AI is good for, being able to process an invoice, Lots being of data. able yeah. to send out a payment to a supplier. Um, those things, I definitely think the humans will start doing them less and less. Mm -hmm. um, however, even with the advancement of AI and technology 
to hit the strategic component, definitely the transformational. It will be humans. It will be the the practitioners leading that, leading that drive. Mm. So um, I don't see AI as a hindrance. I see it as a great advantage. Mm. Um, the way we use Google, I think we will start using AI going forward because when we use Google, we still have to look at the links yeah. and we still have to try to find out. Whereas if you ask AI a question, it gives you the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, like immediately. To me, that is a time saver. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then you can instead of looking at nine, ten different links, and then coming up with that answer, you can look at that answer, then kind of work backwards mm -hmm. to invalidate. Does this does this response help you understand what question you were looking to get answered? So I see it as a beneficial tool, and um, it's one in which we all need to embrace to and survive. Some people. May, may have hated digital watches, yeah. <laughs> but the majority of people, we have digital watches. Mm -hmm. It may have been some who loved their horse. They didn't want to move to an automobile, but people aren't buying horses or riding horses <laughs> anymore. That's right. You know, a technology is going to move our culture forward. Mm -hmm. um, you could either keep up or you will fall behind. The honest answer. One thing that you had said in our planning call, which I thought was interesting, from a buyer, okay. you know, was always be selling. Yes. And when you think about the transactional process, there's a seller and a buyer and you're the buyer, right. but you're saying always be selling. Talk about that a little bit. Why is right. persuasion and the ability to sell important even in your role? Because if you are forced or dictated to do an action, you will only continue to do that action while that pressure is there. Hmm. So, um, but once that pressure is like a remove, chances are there isn't any like emotional attachment mm. to continue to buy those same things, to buy those same services. So, so, so you're not. So the way to be able to forge long-term relationships that are beneficial for your firm, there must be some type of um, internal understanding from your customers on why they should buy this. Mm -hmm. And that is done through a persuasion. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say, hey, go buy this just because I told you to. But it's another thing to say, George, these are the benefits for buying this. These are all of the pluses. These are the minuses if you don't buy them. So when you're evaluating, should you press that button or not, you have that information. I think people want to make good decisions for themselves, for their team, for their families, for their corporations. The more information in which you have to base that decision on, the more comfortable you are in making those some decisions. Mm -hmm. um, however, sometimes you shouldn't be paralyzed I say like the lack of information as well. Mm -hmm. But um, but that is when, if you have build of credibility and trust <laughs> with your customers, then they are more um, able to be able to take that leap forward and to agree with your recommendation and move forward with that purchase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I believe we're always selling um, annually, when we have our meeting with our boss, unless you are a entrepreneur and own your own firm, you are selling yourself on why you should get a promotion, why you should get bonuses, et cetera. Like every, every opportunity we have to sell our own brand. And it's based on the, the acceptance of that sale um, that equals buy-in it equals traction, it equals a sustainable improvements on, on areas for your life. A leader is only a leader because people are following them. Mm. He, she, or they can have titles. You know, you could be president of the United States. You could be CEO or CFO. That's a title, but you aren't a leader unless you have people motivated to follow you. In our profession, we have to show the benefits of working with procurement. Mm -hmm. 
because because we buy things on our own personally. We say, well, I can do that. <laughs> you know, like the same way doctors probably, you know, say, well, I have a cold, well, I could fix it. I don't have to go to a doctor or I'm feeling sad. I don't have to go like speak to someone about it. I could just suck it up. Mm-hmm. We all, the things that we do daily, we feel like we are already experts for it. And sometimes we don't value the uh, the processes and the deeper opportunities that, that we have to enhance that to make things better. Uh, so it's a positive and also a negative. So at a high level, although you may not have heard of the word procurement before, you understand buying stuff, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and yeah, you know, like I do this every day. So why do we have to have this contract? Or why do we have to have a detailed list of prices? Or why do we have to end up doing that? Um, unfortunately, procurement Increases in value when when environments have have like a downward turn. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my first customers, they didn't produce purchase orders. They were making um, double digit growth for like eight eight consecutive years. So who needs to manage spend? Mm-hmm. You know, we, we just spend and we just get this revenue going like. Why do we have to have all of these type of controls? Um, so it, it isn't until that like great, that great like reservoir of revenue is gone is then they say, oh, okay. So now like let's analyze, like why are we paying so much for this? Mm-hmm. Like what's the reason for it? Or why is this happening? Like challenging environments is when you see an elevation within procurement. Mm-hmm. And then once things start going well, ironically, those same customers, they tend to not view procurement as that important because we got so much revenue coming in. <laughs> Everything is good. <laughs> so it's always a cyclical on trend. Sure. Yeah. And it sounds like some of the things that you were discussing aren't just professional skills, they're life skills. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, so. yes, indeed. Uh, I am a big proponent of um, using the sk- same skills in which you have throughout your life. Mm. To me, what works in my personal life works in my professional life and vice versa. Um, I'm not savvy enough to say, hey, I'm only gonna be one way here and another way there. Um, to me, that would be taxing. Yeah. Um, I would rather uh, just be my authentic self and the things that work for me. I've seen they've been able to work in different areas or aspects of my life. Mm-hmm. So um, I think um, the things in which you learn from good people, and again, like it's the intent too. And it goes back to a culture again mm-hmm. and just like the thought process. Um, two books that I recommend everyone read Who Move My Cheese by Spencer. Johnson, okay. and the other one is The um, Secret by Rhonda Byrne. Those two are uh, life-changing reads mm-hmm. if you um, embrace the concepts in which the stories in those, in those books are trying to unteach you. Oh, that's great. That was actually one of my final questions, was a, a resource you could recommend. Why not instead tell me something you're looking forward to in the next 12 months? It can be personal or professional. Okay, but- all right. So for personal... Uh, my son is getting married next fall, oh, wow. so I will have a future daughter-in-law, so I'm really That's excited about congratulations. that. Congratulations. Um, for professionally, and this is kind of constant, I'm looking forward to trying to gain additional influence to help the next generation mm. of procurement professionals, to help the next Vernon Griffin, who prior to working Within procurement, I was a special education behavior disorder teacher's assistant Mm -hmm. and seventh and eighth grade basketball coach (laughs) at Urbana Middle School. Oh, wow. And I was given the opportunity to become a procurement professional as a promotional items buyer. So, hey, we need 12 golf shirts, place an order. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, ironically, it became a lifelong career. So I won the opportunity to create more Vernon Griffin. Hmm. Um, and I'm here just because of giants, that people who reach back 
and share their expertise and their knowledge and their experience to help me develop my craft. So I feel an obligation to pass that on. Hmm. And, you know, that is what drives me. Well, let's finish with this question then. What would you say to a future procurement professional or someone that wanted to model some of the success that you've had? Um, embrace change. Oh, that, that makes sense. <laughs> embrace change yeah. and see problems as an opportunity. Hmm. So if no one is signing up for, say, a set project because they believe that it is hard, those are the things to sign up for. Those are the things. Um, sign up for the difficult projects or the projects that, you know, like people are shedding away from because they aren't easy. Or it's, it will accelerate your career hmm. by tackling problems and finding solutions for them. Great advice, great perspective, and unique uh, uh, insights that you you brought to the show today. Thank you so much, Vernon. It's been a, it's been a wonderful conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation. Oh,